Hello! So, uh, let's talk about the second part of uh, the First Soldier Sun book. So this is uh, Shaman's Crossing chapters, I believe, 8 to 15 is what I read. Um, for those who've read the book before, it's starting from Navarre's trip to the Academy up to and including the second seance with Epini. Um, so, uh, I have a lot of thoughts about this section, but I'm not sure how much of a video this will make. We'll see. This is a very different story than what I, than anything written by Sanderson, which is what I'm most used to covering on this channel. So, I'm still sort of figuring out how to talk about, um, a book like this, a book that has a a bit of a slower plot, a, a bit more introspective, perhaps. Um, I am enjoying it greatly. Um, and I and what parts I'm not enjoying, I think I'm not supposed to be enjoying. Uh, we'll get back to that in a moment. Um, so, first things first, I want to say the pacing in this section uh, gets really suddenly slow in a way I wasn't expecting, uh, based on the speed at which events were happening during the first seven chapters of the book, the way we were skipping months or years at a time between chapters, I was kind of under the assumption that by the time I was, by the time I got to making this, this second video, uh, Nevare would be well out of the academy and on the field as an officer. But no, it's actually only been six weeks uh, in these chapters. Um, and that's not necessarily a criticism. Uh, the story has slowed down, and it has also moved away from the part of the story I find most interesting, which is obviously the relationship between the Gernians and the Plains people, uh, and the various relationships between different groups of Plains people, like whatever is going on between Dewara's people and the Specs. Um, but I think that's on purpose. I think the story has sort of moved us away from that and focused on the petty day-to-day -day problems of Navarre's life as a cadet, uh, as a very purposeful way to sort of, um, <clears throat> uh, to sort of make a point, I think, which, and I think that point, at least the way I feel about it right now, is that ultimately the point is going to be that all of these petty squabbles within Gernian society, the political intrigue, the new noble, old noble clashes, are irrelevant in the grand scheme of things uh, compared to the fact that Gernia is currently engaged in a horrific colonial genocide. Uh, and that it is ultimately going to be that genocide that will be the undoing of Gernia and not its internal political squabbles. Um, at least that's what I think. I think that's where we're heading with um, with Navarre's dreams. Clearly, Navarre is part of some plan by the spec uh, sorceress to, uh, to do some serious harm to the Gernian war effort. Um, what exactly that will be, I'm still not sure. Uh, in his dreams, it manifests as a forest overgrowing the academy grounds and the city, but I don't know if that's literal or metaphorical. Um, so, so yeah, that, uh, speaking of the dreams, by the way, the dreams are kind of the only thing that keeps Nevare an actually compelling character right now. Nevare has, Nevare has grown into a very boring young man. And again, this is not a criticism, because I think that's what we're supposed to think. I think that uh, Robin Hobb is showing us how the oppressive, borderline fascistic values of this society, which force people into a very specific mold and do not let them even consider other possibilities for their life, the way this uh, this this cultural pressure uh, 
turns bright, exciting, adventurous young boys, such as the Nevare of the first few chapters, who was uh, who was much more of a typical fantasy protagonist, much more active, much more of an agent in the plot. Uh, it turns it turns everyone into just cogs in the machine. And now we've gotten to the point where Nevare himself is constantly realizing about himself that he no longer has he no longer has agency and he also no longer has the has like the the drive to do things. He is afraid to step out of line, afraid to step on the wrong toes. He lets in things that he considers unjust happen before him. He is a coward in his own estimation because that is what the system he lives in has turned him into. Uh, and that is what presumably his connection with the with the spec sorceress is uh, hopefully going to help him break out of. Uh, whether that will be whether that will lead him to a better place or just to a differently bad place remains to be seen. I'm betting more on the latter. My overall impression of this story so far, tonally, is that this is not a story where Nevare is going to be happy for great for very long periods of time. Um, at least that is what I suspect so far. Um, but yeah, like I said, uh, his dreams are kind of the, the main thing keeping my interest uh, in his chapters, because... Well, no, that's not true. I'm interested in his chapters, but they're the main thing that keeps my interest in his point of view, in his internal life. Because the events happening around him are more interesting than what's happening in his head. And the reason they're more interesting is because they're starring some more interesting characters, some characters who are more, uh, who, who are rather less uh, tightly molded by the system. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about Spink, Gord, and Epiny. Um, and if it weren't for Nevare's dreams, I would go so far as to say that this entire section should have been from their points of view, one or more of their points of view, rather than from Nevare's. Um, I don't actually think that, though, because, like I said, his dreams are obviously important. Um... But yeah, it, it's interesting to see how um, how Spink, who raised up with who, who was raised without the uh, oppressive power that was Nevare's father, uh, Spink was raised by his mother, who was, as we learn in a conversation with Epini, uh, something of a proto-feminist figure, and Spink, as a result, was raised to be a lot more open-minded and a lot more and a lot less molded into the specific role that he is meant for. Uh, and that makes him a more interesting figure. And I think in many other stories, he might be the protagonist. Uh, but I think Robin Hobb is doing is is making the purposeful decision to sort of contrast him with Nevare in that way. Uh, Gord, on the other hand, we don't know much about how Gord was raised. Uh, but he d But he is someone who naturally, through natural happenstance of birth and biology, simply isn't very fit for the role that this system has assigned to him. Uh, and as a result, we see him chafing against it uh, as well. Uh, Nevare also isn't fit, by the way, but Nevare is not fit on the level of character, not physicality. And because his unfitness for the role is not as visible, he himself has not fully accepted that he is unfit for it. His instructor, the one who suggests he should be a scout, clearly sees that he is unfit for the role that he is training for. But Nevare himself cannot see it. Whereas Gord, I think, is very well aware that he is unfit for the role that has been assigned to him. Um... And Epini, of course, uh, is is my favorite character in this story so far, by far. I absolutely adore Epini. Uh, she's another little proto-feminist, uh, but uh, a very fiery and un outspoken one. Um, in uh, and and it's interesting that her father lets her get away with it. Uh, I'm guessing that there isn't much. 
deeper meaning to that. I'm guessing that he just lets her get away with it because she's daddy's little girl. Uh, and that he, it, it's not like he secretly agrees with her or anything. Um, Uncle Burvell also seems like a fairly uh, by-the-books kind of guy. Uh, by the numbers, rather. Uh, can you say by the book? I'm not sure. I think you can. Yeah, that's a thing you say in English, by the book. Yeah. Um, anyway, a Pinny is a fascinating character. She is clearly the most intelligent character we've met so far. Uh, she has insight into other characters that no one else has, and I don't mean the supernatural kind. I mean she just understands people in a much on a much deeper level and more quickly and and instantly than any other character, including much older and more educated people. Uh, and the most interesting thing, of course, is her ties to the supernatural on the one hand and her sort of proto-feminist rhetoric on the other. And I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on the supernatural thing first because I do have some more extensive thoughts on the sort of socio-political things going on in this section later. Um, so, the seances that we see here, uh, first of all, it is immediately apparent that these are genuine. There is no obfuscation. There is no attempt to make the reader even for a moment question whether this is genuine. It very much is. Um, and what I like about this is that it is a very, uh, a very interesting way to sort of work magic into a setting. Because this is a, at first glance, setting that basically has no magic. Uh, but the reason that it seems that way is that the dominant culture that we are seeing, i.e. Gernian culture, kind of just doesn't acknowledge magic, but they're aware that it exists. Like, they use the charms on their horses, there are uh, many people in this society engage in seances and spirit summoning, including the queen. And as we see here, that is, in fact, actual magic that actually happens. Uh, so magic is, like, basically fully incorporated into everyone's day-to-day -day lives. But everyone just kind of, like, it's considered gosh or inappropriate to acknowledge just how just how much magic there is in this world because it's 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 kind of considered you know inappropriate i guess um which is a really interesting way to do it i don't think i've ever seen that before i don't think i've ever seen a setting where magic is both widely normalized but also not openly acknowledged that's a weird combination, and I'm curious to see where that goes world-building-wise. Um, I'm not going to comment too much on what is actually going on with Navarre. It is clear that he is, in some way, an agent, an unwitting agent of the Spec Witch. Uh, it is clear that she has placed some kind of metaphorical seed inside his mind that she has access to and through which she can potentially control him. And, she, and he is essentially a ticking time bomb that has been implanted in the Gernian military to be activated at a time that suits her interests. Uh, so I am very excited to see that happen because, as you might imagine, uh, I am very much on the side of the Plains people so far and not the Gernian military. Uh, so anything that uh, ruins their plans is probably going to be something I'm going to support, even if it comes at the cost of uh, Nevare's happiness and ability to uh, fulfill his role in life. Um, now, I'm going to go back to the matter of Epini's and Spink's mother's feminism, and I'm also going to go back to a character I kind of glossed over, which is Gord. Um... And the reason I want to talk about this is because there's... Okay, so I'm going to start with Gord. At the start of this section, when Gord was first introduced as a character, and for several chapters after that, I had concerns about this book. Because 
I found while reading popular fantasy, especially modern fantasy, that by the 21st century, by the time you get to stuff written in the late 20th, early 21st century, overt, explicit racism and misogyny have largely been expunged from the lexicon of mainstream fantasy authors. There's still obviously implicit racism and misogyny in a lot of fantasy, but it's not, it doesn't get explicit. Uh, and you, you, and you still do occasionally get homophobia and transphobia as well, uh, but it's much less common to be super explicit than it was in the past. But what hasn't really been eliminated is very overt and explicit fat phobia. This is not a fantasy thing, it's a genre fiction thing in general. Uh, genre fiction has always had and continues to have a pretty big problem with the way that fat people are written. Uh, so does so does literary fiction, actually, most of it. But uh, but you know, I'm I'm more familiar with genre fiction. Um, and as a result, even though I've already gleaned that Robin Hobb is a person of fairly progressive politics, I did not I did not think it unlikely that this book could end up being very, very fat phobic in the way that Gord was written. And the first few chapters really seemed to confirm that for me because the way he was written was heavily focusing on his physicality. He was constantly described in sort of terms of disgust or horror. Uh, there was a strong focus on his inability to do things, on his, um, uh, on the way he greedily ate food more than the other boys, and so forth. Uh, and so I sort of resigned myself after a while to just sort of deal with that as an issue in this book. But Robin Hobb pleasantly surprised me because after a after a couple of chapters, well, not really after a quite num quite a number of chapters. Uh, it becomes clear that this is not the book's prejudice against Gord, but specifically the character's prejudice, including Nevares, our narrators. You see, all of the descriptions of Gord greedily eating food or barely being able to run or whatever, or, or of his body being described in these negative terms. All of these descriptions came to us from Nevare's narration. And once and once Nevare realizes that he has maybe misjudged Gord, he actually has this moment where he like sort of goes back retroactively and sort of corrects his own narration. Like uh, in particular I remember him saying him thinking to himself like, "Oh wait, actually Gord doesn't eat more than us. He eats the same as everyone else. I just, I just viewed him eating normally as, as worthy of condemnation because he's fat. Uh, which is a very realistic depiction of how these things work. I, this is a very real thing that a lot of people sort of assume about fat people, which is that, uh, like, you know, if you're fat, you can't really eat in front of other people without being judged. Even if you're eating, like, the same food in the same amounts as everyone else. You are expected to basically deny yourself food. As sort of penance for, for being fat. Which is... Um, well, I do think it's a very culturally Christian attitude. Um, sort of uh, Christ Christianity sort of imbues culture with a significant emphasis on the denial of physical desires uh, as a, a sign of moral righteousness. Um, so I, I, I don't know how common that is in non-Christian cultures. Um, that particular form of fatphobia. 
Uh, but I am glad that it that it gets addressed here and that we do actually see that it is Nevare who is prejudiced here and not the not the omnip omniscient narration. Um, so that was good. And that brings us to the second uh, sort of socio-political element that sort of weaves itself through this section of the book. Um, and that is the issue of women's rights within this setting. And here again, the fun part is that Navarre is thoroughly in the wrong and remains so. Navarre... Navarre is completely unable to recognize the injustice faced by women in this society. Uh, he has it explained to him in great detail by both Spink and Epini in these last few chapters I read. And the narration makes it clear that Navarre literally just does not understand what they're talking about. Like, their words are not getting through his head. He, he thinks they've gone insane. It, 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 it's, really, it's really interesting to read, because I do think that that is how... That is a very realistic depiction, I think, of someone who has been so thoroughly indoctrinated into uh, this deeply repressive system being faced for the first time with an argument against the system, and especially in this case, an argument that doesn't actually relate to him. Like, if he was faced with an argument about, oh, maybe soldiers' sons should be able to inherit land, I imagine he might be a bit more open to considering that. He would, he would still be very reluctant, I think, at first, but I can see him sort of at least seeing where the person is coming from. But the idea of women having rights? Unthinkable! Um, so, so yeah, I do, like the, I do like the decision, actually, to create this extremely unlikable and repressive society. And then instead of having a protagonist who is opposed to it from the start, which would be the easy the easy, typical way to write a story in a setting like that. We have a protagonist who is pretty much on board with everything, even the stuff that hurts him. He doesn't see it as hurting him. Um, he is starting to at least question the hierarchy of the noble families, but only... only because... Uh, only because he thinks that it goes against the principles of their society, because he feels like, oh, on paper, the old and new nobles are equal, so they should be treated equally. Um, but he doesn't really question the idea of their being nobles, or the idea of birth order determining your profession, or the idea of women being consigned to uh, reproductive household labor. Um... So I do so I do find that very compelling as as an as an element of this story. I do wonder how much it's going to continue being relevant going forward because a lot of stories like this I've found a lot of stories that start out sort of rooted in the mundane and then as I suspect this story is going to over time become more fantastical and deal with more fantastical threats and more and more sort of a grand conflicts between nations and and races and species and gods and so forth. Uh, I find that a lot of stories like that, if they have some compelling social critique in that early section, sort of lose track of it once they become more fantastical. So I'm kind of wondering if that's the fate of this trilogy. Um, I will be very pleasantly, uh, pleasantly surprised if it's not, because I've read so many stories where that happens, including, by the way, the Stormlight Archive. Uh, I don't think I've really talked about that in any of my Stormlight Archive videos, but that's very much something that happened in that series. Sort of just a, 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 like a, a forgetting of a lot of the social critique that was going in, on in the first few books. Um, so I'm hoping that these threads of sort of 
questioning the gender dynamics of this society, for instance, keep being brought up. Um, and obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm hoping that we will also eventually deal with the whole colonialism and genocide thing, but I, I'm more confident that we will because I still very much feel like that's what this story is ultimately going to be about on some level. Um, so, uh, I think that's about everything I have to say about this section. I, I haven't really talked about the plot going on in the Academy, like the conflict between the old nobles and the new nobles, in part because I just don't find that particularly compelling and I don't really have anything to say about it. Um, I, it, it, it feels like a very realistic political conflict which is nice. It doesn't feel forced. It feels like it would naturally arise from the material conditions that have been established for this setting, uh, which, as a, as a social scientist, I am always happy to see. Uh, cultural and political conflicts usually arise from material conditions, and in this case, that is very much the case. So it's well handled, I don't have any criticisms of it, but I also don't have many thoughts on it for now. Maybe I will after I finish the book and see where that goes when I see how that conflict comes to a head, which I'm sure it will. But for now, not really. Um, so, yeah, I think that's about everything I have to say for now. Uh, I will see you all next week. Uh, have a good one. Bye.